Well, it's the Monday after the 4th of July. Had a lot of fun. Hope you guys did too. Um, hope you have all 10 of your digits and uh, your house is still standing. That would be awesome. Uh, took the Jeep out, had a pretty good time. Um, this thing did really well, but it is still pretty stock. So, um, found a few problems with it. One, um, power steering gets hot super, super fast. So I need to do something about that. We're thinking a big power steering cooler. I'll probably throw a filter in line as well when I do that. Um, possibly maybe even a, a fan on it to keep it uh, as cool as we can possibly get it. Had that problem. Uh, that was probably the most significant. Um, we took it to Big Bear uh, because Gorman was closed and the Azusa wash basin thing was, you had to make an appointment, which yeah, that's retarded. If you gotta make an appointment to go somewhere to do off-roading, that's just too many people for me. So we took it up the Big Bear, um, went to, forgot the name of the trail, uh, but the one we went to was a black diamond, you know, figured we gotta lift the Jeep, not too bad. Uh, we were reading, a lot of people were saying, you know, you want at least 35s, we're sitting on 33s. There was a couple guys in there that did it on 33s. We got there and then realized, yeah, this thing's every bit of black diamond. I've been on some black diamond trails before that I thought, you know, I don't know who named, who gave us the black diamond rating, but you know, it sure as heck wasn't black diamond, but this one was, believe me, um, it was every bit of black diamond rocks in the beginning like i walked the first part of it kind of up the up the trail and and it's as it switched back and it was nothing but just big boulders and totally totally fun stuff but not something that we were quite equipped for um could it have done it probably we would have tore the jeep up doing it um but we need to get better prepared for that so we went ahead and went on a uh said it was a uh, mild or mid or whatever I, I don't know what color it was but um, basically it was a medium off-road uh, which I, I think it was lighter than medium in my opinion but it did have a lot of uphill um, it had a lot of ruts it had a lot of rocks uh, had a lot of fun stuff um, so we actually had a really good time um, I'm glad we took that trail too because we like I said we found a lot of problems with the Jeep that we need to address before we go out next time, right off the bat, it needs 37s. There's no question about it. Um, it needs 37s to really be as capable as it is. Um, but then again, putting 37s on it and us being on a on a trail that was, you know, pretty mild, um, it still had a overheating the steering problem. So we need to address those two things: bigger tires, fix the steering cooling. Uh, give it more cooling capacity. Um, the front sway bars do unlock, which was nice. Um, however, the backs don't disconnect at all. Um, so I need to look into something for rear sway bar disconnects um, so that you can really get into the articulation, especially if you're gonna do some kind of black diamond, big rocks, that trail we wanted to go on. Um, as you can see, I put the uh, stinger bar on a tree um, I didn't run into a tree. I just was getting, I needed the, the space. So I just nosed it right up to the tree. Um, this thing did great. We never had to use the winch. Um, still some rocks in this thing. There we go. Uh, we're definitely gonna have to drop the, uh, the sides of the bumper here. I don't think we're gonna have to go to a high line, but I guess we'll find out when we get the big 37s on it. Lockers lockers are still a problem um we were able to get it in and out of the you know because we're switching between uh rear locker and front and rear locker um and you know what when you're trying to navigate the course and you know really turn a lot you don't want the front lockers on you only want the front locker when you need to really kind of climb um Otherwise the steering doesn't really do anything. You overheat it and it's, so we were switching a lot back and forth and it would do it. It was just slow to react. 
um, because of again it, it's it's design is a, a little pin that drops down and then it's picked back up by a magnet i think is how that works um it struggled with that so lockers definitely needs those air lockers um so tires wheels tires cooling on the power steering air lockers drop these sides um we didn't get into the uh, rock sliders at all, um, but I, you know we'll see what happens uh, when we do get that far. But one of the things we noticed that coming on the way back, it got into a, it started to get into a death wobble um, on the highway coming back. So, and then I climb underneath and it's got the stock Mopar uh, steering stabilizer. That needs to be upgraded. We need to go to, a, uh, a double steering stabilizer, something that's a little beefier. Um, and then I need to get underneath and look at all of the, the, the suspension. Again, make sure the lift kit is all still tight. Everything looks fine. There's no damage anywhere. The other thing I was noticing is with the springs, we were getting a lot of popping. Um, so I don't know if those perches need to be replaced. The, uh, you know, the little uh, isolator on the perch. Um, so as we would turn, and it was weird that we would do it when we were turning because remember this is straight axle with kingpins um or not kingpins sorry it's it's upper and lower ball joints but it's kind of got like that kingpin kind of look anyways um that the that solid axle doesn't turn um it's just the wheels that turn and so it's funny that we were getting that spring popping when we were turning the wheels when they don't turn so i don't know what's going on there i need to take a look at that um but definitely, you know, we found uh, quite a few little issues with it um, just in that little little bit of time. I think the shocks do need to be upgraded on this. Um, some kind of remote reservoir, bigger, uh, something that can handle a little bit more. Um, especially having the front end get into that death wobble. Now, usually the death wobble is, is the uh, steering and, and uh, the wheels and tires, that kind of stuff. It gets in, you know. You can see the wheel just jumping back and forth. Didn't do it real bad, only happened for a second, um, and it pulled itself right back out of it, which is great, but still you don't want that to happen at all. So a few things we need to uh, look into on this Jeep um, and get them, beef it up, and then take it out again. So unfortunately, the next time it goes out, probably won't be till next year. It might go out again uh, this year sometime. I, I doubt it. Um, so. I've got a list of things that I want to do to that, to this thing. It is going to happen at some point, um, not anytime soon though. But I want to give you guys an update being that we just went over this thing to take it out over the weekend. As you can see, I don't know if you can see, but we ran it through some trees and, <laughs> and really kind of put it through its paces. I mean, that's what it's for. So um, it was kind of, you know, had a yuppie Jeep look to it because it was, you know, street driven. We had it off road a couple times, but um it was polished and clean and you know not that you want to scratch the sh you know your 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 really nice jeep but at the same time you know it's uh, now it's got a badge of honor so it's got some good uh scuffs and scratches down it i'll wash it up have the detail guy come and uh um clean it up polish it a bit uh he doesn't need to get all the scratches out just want to clean it up make it look good and then put some um uh, some more wax on it if you keep a car waxed and you get into situations like this now deep scratches that actually dig into the paint it's not going to protect against that but if you rub against a bush or a tree or something like that and it puts these little lines in there the wax will actually grab it and then you can um you can just pretty much wipe it right off when you go to clean it some light polishing they come right out anyways uh that's where we're at on this one it did really well the other thing that it did do and i need to look into this really 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 bad fuel smell um, so that is something we're definitely going to have to address. Um, I, I, I'm talking really bad where we're looking underneath the Jeep to make sure that it's not actually leaking fuel anywhere. It was so bad. Um, so I need to look into that. Um, other than that, you know, did really well. So we'll throw a bunch of parts at it, put a bunch of money into it, take it out again, see how it does and then see where the weak parts are, bring it back, build it bigger, take it back out, 
keep doing that. <clears throat> Our plan at this time is to actually buy another one. Um, we talked a lot, me and the owner talked a lot when we were off-roading about <clears throat> what the plan is for having, you know, a chase vehicle. Uh, whenever you go do something, like, especially a black diamond trail that's 15 miles long off-road, it was highly recommended to bring a friend. Now, not bring a friend and put them in the passenger seat. They're talking about bring a friend and have them in another vehicle. One, in case something goes wrong. And then two, I mean, it gives you an anchor point. It gives you all kinds of other stuff, to, you know, to actually um, help you get through the through that trail. So, um, and then we were talking about what vehicles, what vehicles would actually be able to keep up with this thing in an off-road situation like that. We thought about the Bronco. We thought about a Raptor Bronco. Um, we thought about a Raptor Ranger. Um, the, uh, what was the other thing we were talking about? I don't know. Anyways, <clears throat> we were talking about a few different vehicles. <clears throat> the problem is, is that when you, when you talk Fords, like the Bronco, the Raptor Ranger, one, the Raptor Ranger is not going to do it because it's, it's more like the TRX. The, it's too long, right? The, the, the axle space, whatever you call that. Anyways, um, it's too long. <clears throat> it's too light in the back, so it's just going to hop. Um, the, it's just not going to be good. The Bronco would probably do pretty well. However, the amount, of, the amount of parts that they make for this versus what they make for the Bronco is night and day. So you can t fine tune this thing with the just massive amounts of parts that are out there and available for it. Um, so, and then we, you know, and then we were talking about maybe the Gladiator. Um, I think that was the other one we were possibly talking about. But then with the Gladiator, you get into the length, the, the wheelbase. That's what I meant, wheelbase. I couldn't think of that. <clears throat> but then you get into that same problem with the wheelbase. A little bit longer, um, light in the back, um, all the same problems that you would have with like the Raptor Ranger. Um, wouldn't do a regular Ranger. That four cylinder turbo is just not going to be enough. The 27 twin turbo would do a lot better, but again, long wheelbase, light in the back end, it's not going to do very well. So <clears throat> we came back to the Jeep. So, and now that the Jeep 392 has actually been out for a while, we can actually pick up a used one um, and then build it up the same way this thing. So we're just gonna build it a twin, you know, is basically what's gonna happen, unless the owner decides he likes something else when he goes out shopping. <clears throat> Who knows, we might do a Raptor Ranger or a Raptor uh, Bronco, I don't know. Anyways, uh, I think the plan is to just build it a twin. So whatever we do to this one, we'll kind of use this as the test platform. And then when the next one comes, we'll just throw all the same parts on the next one and it'll go right to whatever stage this one is in. Make it easy, make it nice. Um, and then you've got two of them you can run around and have a good time with. Um, but, so that's that. That's what happened with the, with the Jeep. We had a really great time, um, but it does need a lot of work. So now we're back here on the Camaro. Let's move over there. Back here on the Camaro, this is where we're gonna be. Uh, the Jeep's gonna go sit off to the side for a while i need to get to these others so we're here on the camaro um where we left off last was the ac lines and how i was going to actually fix that i had spent quite a few nights thinking about it um quite a few days looking at my options and i thought well the owner's going to be here um I respect his decision he, he, or, or his advice and, and everything else in his decisions. Um, he is a, an experienced automotive engineer um, and he, you know, he knows his stuff. So um, talking to him, I, get, I basically broke it down to three options with the AC. We can put the battery back in the trunk and then just run the AC lines the way they were. That's probably the easiest of all of the options. Or we can take the battery tray, the stock battery tray, and lift it up. Eighth of an inch would do just fine. You know, maybe even a quarter if you, could, if you wanted to go up that high. Um, then you would have room for that low pressure line to be able to go through and have no problems. The real way to fix it, and this is what I told him, I said this is the, this is the I'm gonna make it completely awesome like this car is kind of fix would be to take this whole 
for this whole front section right here off the car and redo the hard lines that come through the fender all the way up to where instead of them dumping out and coming out right here where the battery is they would actually cut back and come out right behind the headlight bucket and that would allow the hard lines to go all the way down and come out pop out right there your low pressure line would actually pop out and dip underneath the car and come into the pump it'd be fine and great you'd redo your your high pressure in that same way it would just go instead of dipping down going underneath and then coming across and going through the fender it would just go straight across and pop right in the line to be a little short line i said but obviously that's a lot of work don't care about how much work it is which way do you want to do it you know what's your what's your thought and so we talked a lot about it back and forth back and forth and um, discussed all the different options and stuff basically long story longer we came down to putting the battery back in the trunk <laughs> you know and it's it's funny that it actually came out that way that we're just like you know what let's just put the battery back in the trunk the reason we the the 100% main reason why we did that is because we do want to be able to run this on a track now whether it be a road course or just like having fun doing quarter mile runs with it it needs a catch can right now there is no room for a catch can um, everything's been taken up we got the air box on the driver's side if the battery was on the passenger side it would take up all of that space there's really not any room I mean, I could fit one in here. Um, they make neat little catch cans that would go right here. Um, you know, but then you've got this part that's just kind of bulky with the battery. And, and so I gave them the options. I showed them the catch cans that I had found. Um, all they were for a G body, I think, but they, it, it looked pretty good. I, I'm pretty sure I can make it fit. Um, might have to do some gets creative with the brackets um, but I could put a nice little catch can right here um, even have it black uh, to kind of blend in and then have it just poke into the radiator and it'll all be good and he says you know what we're fighting with the AC to try and get the battery in the car um, now we're going to be fighting with the catch can because we want a catch can in order to go down the track you got to have one just put the battery back in the trunk um, now the design that of the bot with the battery in the back of the trunk the way the previous person did it they just got one of those aluminum boxes from summit probably dropped it in there sliced out some holes ran a battery cable connected it to the frame you know it's simple easy way obviously he's like don't do that but put it in the trunk so what i did was i just spent all morning shopping on summit bought a optima red top because this one's dead optima red top um bought a uh, a nice billet aluminum plate that you basically bolt down and then the Optima slips into it and it's got these two fingers front and back of the battery that hold the battery down in place that, that way there's nothing around the top there's nothing to get into the posts there's nothing to get into the side posts it's very open they make a lot of Optima battery hold downs that just it's a big aluminum plate that goes across the top and in my mind I'm thinking well you put your terminal on there you're like that far away from that aluminum plate having all that power doesn't make a lot of sense so I like that ability aluminum hold down so um, and then the where they had it you know in the trunk of the car you've got your main trunk space and then you've got your right behind the the uh, the wheel tubs well they had it they had it mounted on the passenger side down in the actual trunk space I'm gonna lift it up put it up behind the wheel tub um, not not that you won't be able to see it, it just opens that trunk up a little bit more and it makes it look a little more dressed out and where it should be if you were gonna do something like that. So I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna move it over there. Bought some battery cable. Um, <clears throat> Summit had uh, um, one gauge, black, 50 feet. It was like $270 for 50 feet and, and I got it black and red, so there's a, uh, you know, $500, 600 probably after tax and just battery cable. Um, <clears throat> got some Moroso battery terminals. Um, I put them on my car. Uh, they're real nice. You do, you do a, uh, an eyelet connection on your, on your battery cable and then it bolts down to that Moroso battery terminal. But then it also has, I think, three other little terminals. So if you need to put 
you know, power to, for the car or power for, you know, something, you're not stacking and stacking and stacking on that one little bolt that you've got your battery cable to. You can just add to it. it makes it real clean, real nice. Um, again, I put it on my 65 hardtop, worked great. Um, then I started to go through and order some of the other things that I knew I was going to need. Um, so battery, battery cable, um, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, I bought the catch can, which the catch can is actually about the size of the battery, just not the width of the battery. It's about half of a battery. So basically it's going to look like just a, an extension of the radiator right here. And then it'll just have a little tube that pops over real nice. I couldn't find one that was powder coated black. However, I could always take it down to the powder coater and have them powder coated black. Um, right now it's just, I think raw brushed aluminum or something is what they call it. Um, it would look good if it was powder coated black. So I might do that depending on how it looks after I put it in. So that's where we're at. <laughs> Unfortunately, all of that work going into trying to put the battery in the front of the car. Now we're just going to put it right back into the back of the car, but that's okay. Because remember we did find a few issues with the car when we were going through this process. So you never look at anything negatively. We found some problems before we got the car on the road. One, the AC lines that were running through the fender right here were rattling really bad. They were loose. They could have rubbed a hole and sprung a leak. Then we definitely have to take this fender off where now we secured them. So they're not gonna rub, they're not gonna leak. Everything's gonna be fine. We took the grill out of the car, found out that the grill was holed in horribly and the grill was broken. So that part's fixed. Figured out why the trim didn't look right on the grill because of how they had it installed. It wasn't right. So that gives us a chance to fix those items, um, which is fantastic. So I don't look at it as a fail, I look at it as we found other issues in the process and got those resolved and worked through a problem, you know, and found a solution for it. So fixing the AC going forward, real simple. I just connect those lines back up the way they were, back in the system down and we're good to go. The battery goes back in the trunk. All of those parts coming in that I just ordered to make that work will be in, we'll run the battery cables, all that'll be great. So now we're back to, um, you know, working on the rest of the car again. We've solved that, solved that problem. So let me get these things done real quick and then uh, we'll come back in, see what we need to tackle next. Okay, so I, I've <laughs> I really got to get to, um, to organize in the shop. Uh, it's getting pretty counterproductive trying to find equipment tools I gotta put all this stuff away as much as I want to jump on this car it took me two hours to find the little harbor freight pump and my uh, harbor freight AC gauges remember guys you don't gotta buy super expensive tools to get the job done you know, some of the less expensive stuff does just, just as good of a job. So it's all about just knowing how to use it. So, but, uh, you know, finding it two hours, digging through boxes. Uh, I can't keep doing this. So I think I'm probably going to take next couple days and, uh, at least get the tools out, get those organized and the supplies, get the supplies out, get those organized. Um, Cause that's, I mean, what's the point in working on the car? I can't get anything done. If everything's going to take two hours to find the equipment, then it ain't going to work. So, but uh, so you can see, I got the hoses all hooked back up. When you do that, you always want to go through and make sure you're checking the, uh, the O-rings, you know, Run them around in your hand, uh, feel if they're stiff, uh, if they've got flat edges on them, um, especially if they've got like a little slit or a little uh, rip or tear in them, definitely change them. Uh, put a little bit of pag oil on them and then slip them back in place. Being mindful of the lip that you're slipping it over, you're not slicing it as you slip it over. And then make sure you get that line all the way seated before you start twisting it back together. It'll leave you with good connections. You won't have any problems. Now I've already tested this, but I'll show you. Um, basically what I do is I turn it on, let it run for a couple minutes. 
let it pull vacuum. Um, you're never gonna really get much more than 28 inches of vacuum. It's just not gonna happen. Um, so when you start to get down to that right off of 30 mark, um, that's pretty much about all you're ever gonna be able to pull uh, as far as vacuum goes. Now I hook up both high side and low side, even, the, even though the high side over here doesn't have any negative. Um, I still open it up. I want the vacuum to pull from every angle it possibly can. That's two sides of the system. So um, it's not gonna hurt it to go, to go down. It didn't even touch the, the little limit needle. Um, so no big deal there. Let it run for a couple minutes. Leave all your valves open, leave everything open. And then just go ahead and take your uh, supply off. Um, and then what you're gonna do is just sit here, watch your gauges for a second. See if those move. Um, now when you do that, you wanna make sure you got your Schrader valve is in place. Um, all that kind of stuff so that when you take it off, the, uh, you don't lose your vacuum. So let me, uh, let me zoom in here and I'll kinda show you what I'm talking about. So let me get closer because zoom's not zooming enough. It's about as close as I can get to the car. Sorry, guys. But as, if you can see on the gauge right there, uh, you know, we're down just off of 30. And so what you're going to do now is just leaving it sit. You're going to going to wait and see if that moves. Um, now, if you've got any type of leak, you're pretty much going to see it almost immediately. Um, what I do is I, as I usually put that kind of vacuum on it and, and when, after we're done filming, I'll, I'll let the vacuum sit on there for about another five to 10 minutes. Um, that way I know one, I'm pulling all the moisture out of the system as possible. And then two, um, well, really that's it. Just one, just pulling all the moisture out. It's all you want to do. I've already reached the vacuum that I want to stay at the long period of under vacuum on the machine again is just pulling the moisture out so i'm going to go ahead and i would disconnect it uh, from the machine um, and then make sure all your fittings are tight make sure everything's tight leave it overnight <clears throat> i'm going to come back in the morning and i should see the needle in the same spot now if it's not in the same spot um, first of all you could have a leak somewhere in your testing equipment in the gauge in the in the valve here in the connection here, even the connection down there on the car. So, so if the gauge does move, don't go immediately jump into the car where you did your repair um, because you may just have a fitting loose here or uh, a line here that's got a pinhole leak in it um, from being stored or, or maybe when you set it down last time, a tool hit it. Um, you know, gauges, these gauges especially are, are really cheap. Um, in fact, what I did is because these are pretty inefficient, um, or not inefficient, inexpensive. <laughs> if they were inefficient, I wouldn't use them. It, inexpensive. Um, I went ahead, what I did is I bought two of them. And the reason I did that is because if I'm pulling vacuum on a car and then all of a sudden I'm not being able to hold vacuum and I'm reassured myself that the car is good, I can test the equipment by simply just putting on that other set of gauges. Now, is it possible to have two bad sets of gauges? Sure, 100%, you know. One of the ways you can actually test that is to simply just take your fittings off of the car itself. These are little hangers. Uh, they don't go anywhere, they don't do anything. They're just made to hang the lines. So you could hang the lines up here um, and then just pull it down on vacuum. You should be able to put this whole piece of equipment under vacuum without it leaking. Um, if you can't do that, then obviously you have a problem somewhere. You have a seal in here or here, or maybe this one, the Schrader valve in here, little O-rings in these, the gauges might be leaking. Again, anywhere, even in your, uh, in your connectors, connections down here on the actual car. So <clears throat> those are some of the things you can do to kind of test the, the, the equipment that you have. Um, for me, it's just simple to have another set of gauges on hand. That way I can quickly pull these off throw the other set on and see if I have the same problem. Um, they're real easy to set up They're You know, screw these in, screw those in, screw the vacuum into here, open the valves, turn it on. So anyways, that's, uh, that's how I do uh, air conditioning here in the shop. 
without a big fancy AC machine because technically you don't need that machine. The only real time you need that machine is if you're trying to recover uh, refrigerant. And if you're trying to recover refrigerant, um, there's lots of shops around there that'll recover that refrigerant for you um, and not charge you anything for it either. Because if they're recovering it, that means that now they have that Freon that they can go ahead and use. Um, so in the case that you take it to a shop and they're telling you, oh, to recover the Freon out of your car, it's gonna cost you, you know, this much money. You tell them, whoa, whoa, wait a second. I'm not asking you to recharge my car. I just need you to recover it. Just, just suck it out, you know. That's free Freon for them. Now, if they won't do it for free, I'm sure there's another shop down the street that will. Because again, that's free Freon for them. So, uh, something to keep in mind. Um, I, I've had a couple shops tell me, oh yeah, you know, oh, an AC, they wanna always sell you the, the AC, you know, system performance, whatever, check, you know, oh, well, we put the machine on and we check this, we check. You're not trying to do that. Anyways, after you get it evacuated safely, um, then you just come use your machines. Put the, this vacuum, I can't remember how much it cost. I don't think it was very much. Gauges are fairly inexpensive. And then after you're all done and the car's running, all you got to do then is just go to um, your auto parts store, buy one of those cans of uh, refrigerant and put that in the system. It's already under vacuum, so as soon as you start the car up and you hit that can, it's gonna immediately suck all, not all, but it's gonna suck that, that Freon into the system, um, which will then in turn start the system uh, and allow you, once the system is actually cycling and running, it'll pull it into uh, the car and you'll be able, and then you can measure it by simply how much is in the can. Right there, easy measurement. Now you're not gonna be able to get 100% of that can, so maybe you, drop 0 0.1, 0 0.2 out of the can. But, and then you can pretty much accurately from there manage how much Freon is going into the can. Now on a car like this, because everything is custom, I, I do it off the, off the pressures. Again, you have these gauges now. So, and if you're not sure what the pressure should be, um, I urge you guys to look it up online. Do a little research. It's super simple. Um, it'll tell you what the cycling should look like, high and low side. Um, it'll tell you, uh, you, can, you can diagnose a lot just off of pressures. You know, if the high is too high or the low is too low, you know, look it up. Do a little research. Um, I think you'll find it quite fun um, to learn that side of it. You'll save yourself money down the road. One of the other things um, that I did today when I was ordering parts uh, for this car, um, the battery, the battery cables, that kind of stuff, I went ahead and also ordered um, a new pressure switch. So for this car, because I've now I've got fans in it, um, I want the fans to be able to come on um, with the air conditioning. So a easy, fast way to do that is to change the, the AC pressure switch to a high low fan switch. Um, so what you end up with now is you'll end up with a, with a low cutoff, a high cutoff, and then also when pressure develops, um, it'll actually turn the fan on uh, under AC. So even if, the, even if the car is cool, but the air conditioning uh, pressures are getting too high, it'll turn the fan on. Um, so I thought that was kind of cool. Um, I've used, I hooked it up in a 65 GTO once. Um, I was in a hurry, uh, it was going to auction, and uh, I actually wired the, the switch up wrong. So the fan didn't quite come on like I wanted it to. It did come on, but it didn't stay on Anyways, there's a couple of different ways you can wire it. One of the ways that I wanted to wire it and the way I'm gonna wire this car is that even with the, uh, the key in the off position and out of the car, if the pressures and the AC is too high, it'll actually turn the fan on to run air across uh, the condenser to cool it down. Um, same thing with the engine. I'm gonna make sure that even with the key off and the power off and the engine off, the fans will still come on if the temperatures in the radiator are high enough. So. Um, and I'll explain how to do that later when we, uh, when we start doing that. But um, so actually this leak down or this, this vacuum test that I'm doing um, doesn't really matter because as soon as that switch comes in, I'm gonna pull this switch here off the front, off the receiver dryer, 
and put the new switch on and then I got to redo this all over again. But this is good practice and then it's also good practice to keep the air conditioning system under vacuum when at all possible. So um, that's pretty much going to do it for today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end this episode here because like I said, I'm trying to get uh, the next couple days and reorganize the shop a little bit before I go diving into this car a little, a little bit more. And I don't want to leave today's work, you know, um, pick it up again in the next couple days. I want to uh, kind of end this here. That way when we do pick up on this car again around Thursday or Friday of this week, um, it'll be a fresh start. We know exactly where we're at. Basically, we just erased all of the past work that we did on the other video, trying to figure out where, what to do with this air conditioning um, and the way we're gonna handle it. But like I said, we did fix the hard lines in the fender. They don't rattle anymore. We found about the grill. Um, you know, we're, we're making progress. That's the most important part. Um, so as always guys, thank you for watching. And um, as always, until next time.